Well, let's begin. Well, let me start by expressing my thanks to Professor Houghton for this opportunity. It was a great disappointment that you all couldn't come to Australia uh, for the International SPL uh, in Adelaide. Uh, but this series has been a marvellous substitute. I'm very grateful to be, uh, for being part of it. I'd also like to thank you all for joining this session at a different time and to accommodate the time zone in Australia. Uh, otherwise, I may have fallen asleep in my own presentation. Well, lectionaries make up over a third of the extant New Testament manuscripts. Yet the study of the tradition as a whole is to a large extent still in its infancy. Several elements complicate the analysis of lectionaries such as their difficulty to navigate, the irregularity of the readings for, uh, in the fixed cycle of the ecclesiastical year, and the fact that there are uh, frequently multiple instances of the same verse in different lections. Uh, in this paper, uh, I present a software package for the editing of uh, an analysis of lectionaries. This is written as a plugin for the manuscript editing uh, software framework Decodex, uh, which I was able to present at the SBL annual meeting in 2018. Uh, today, I'll briefly run through the design of the software and how it works with biblical manuscripts before discussing the new features to use with lectionaries. Uh, to illustrate the software, uh, I'll be discussing um, uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll show you how I've used Decodex Lectionary uh, to just transcribe and analyze a special family of manuscripts in the Arabic lectionary tradition. Uh, this family is interesting from a text critical point of view because the manuscripts uh, share the text of Codex Sinaiticus Arabicus, which is the Arabic version of the Gospels, which includes the highest proportion of non-Byzantine readings. Now, this presentation was originally conceived as uh, or being a paper for the Digital Humanities session at the International SBL meeting. That means that the paper goes into more of the details of the software design than it would have if I were uh, writing the presentation solely for potential users of the program. Um, so I'll be leaving out uh, a few of the technical details and they'll be available in my dissertation and in the software documentation. Uh, but the details that I do go into will hopefully still be, hopefully still be of interest to those without a programming background. Um, because I believe that, and I hope that uh, it's helpful for the text critic to understand the structure of the software to get the most out of it. Well, Decodex is written in Python 3. Well, Python 3 is a high level programming language. It's a scripting language, which means that it doesn't need to be compiled, but it's interpreted at runtime. And so it lends itself to fast development and flexibility. Uh, the popularity of Python has surged in recent years, not least due to its role as uh, becoming the uh, in being the dominant language for use in data science and machine learning. Decodex uses Django, uh, which is a framework for creating complex database-driven uh, database websites in Python. Django is open source and is used by many major websites such as Instagram, The Washington Times and PBS and many others. Uh, Django is highly extensible and has a large user community uh, with an enormous library of extensions available and, and under active development. Working with Django means that there, th there are three avenues to be able to interact with the software. Uh, so here's um, so Decodex builds on top of Django, which is on top of Python. So there's three avenues to be able to interact with the software, each at a different level. Uh, there's the web browser front end. This is the normal and most basic level of interaction. Uh, the user interface is written in HTML and JavaScript using Ajax calls for a fluid responsive interface. This can be set up locally on the user's personal computer so that uh, with the researcher interacting with Decodex through the web browser. Alternatively, Decodex can be placed on a web server and used over the internet for users to be able to collaborate with online. Uh, because of the user interface, uh, because the user interface is HTML based, the uh, Decodex is cross platform be, um, between Windows, Mac, and Linux. Django comes with a sophisticated web based um, administration interface. Uh, the display of each object in the databases can be customized for each class in the model, a uh, class of model. And this gives the user an avenue to be able to interact with the core objects of the database as necessary. This is a sort of medium level interaction with uh, Decodex. And at the deepest level, the user can interact with Decodex in code through the Python API. Uh, this can be done through an interactive shell console. Uh, or just writing a text file as a, with a Python script as a text file, or you can use an interactive Jupyter notebook, uh, or through a, you can create your own uh, Django module to build on top of Decodex if you like. 
Being able to interact with the software at these levels means that Decodex is a powerful tool for users with, an, uh, with or without programming experience. Uh, Decodex was designed to be an abstract framework for studying manuscripts. Its base, uh, its base system is found in the, the Decodex app. This is agnostic to the type of manuscript uh, the user can analyze. The particulars of any type of manuscript, such as uh, biblical manuscripts or lectionaries, are implemented as separate apps with subclasses inheriting from the base classes in Decodex. So other Decodex apps are also in, um, in development and experimental stage, such as one for uh, studying the manuscripts of the Quran, the homilies of St. John uh, Chrysostom, and the standard inscription of Ashkenazapal II. These apps require minimal coding because the uh, general tools are supplied in the core uh, of the codex. And it's easy for any user to write, or any user with programming experience to write a short app to extend the codex to other manuscript types. So let me briefly describe the unit user interface for biblical manuscripts uh, so that the changes for lectionaries are clear when we come to them. The user interface of Decodex is designed to focus the user's attention on the, the manuscript facsimile images in the central panel. The user can scroll seamlessly through the manuscript in the panel. Uh, verse location indicators are shown in, on the top of the facsimile images where you've tagged the location of these verses. Uh, and you can save the location of a verse. Hopefully have a slide for that. Yeah, if you click on the manuscript, it brings up a little box so you can um, tag the location of the beginning of a verse on the manuscript. So you just uh, click and press spacebar for a uh, streamlined workflow. At the top of the screen, hopefully you can see my cursor, uh, is the uh, navigation toolbar. So you can choose the manuscript on the left. Uh, and on the right, you can search for a particular verse. So when you search for a verse, um, that, uh, that loads that verse into the interface and the facsimile images scroll automatically to where it thinks that verse is located, either exactly if that verse has been tagged, otherwise it interpolates based on the other verses that have been tagged already. Uh, on the sides, uh, you can expand the, the central panel over the sidebars uh, so that the user is immersed in the, um, in the manuscript images, images as they fill the screen. So here you go, you can see the uh, the manuscript expands. On the left is a sidebar with images of the various pages. Clicking on a thumbnail will scroll on the central panel to that facsimile image. The folio number and side reference can be tagged for a particular image by double clicking on, on the thumbnail. And you can search for a particular page by the, the page number or by the, the folio and written side reference. Uh, the sidebar on the right shows comparison texts for this verse in, in the database. On the top there are reference texts. Um, each user can choose what reference text they, they wish to have at the top. And on the bottom are other manuscripts that are in the database. Uh, you can click on the copy button down here, uh, and that will copy the text uh, into the transcription box. So you can use uh, that as a base text uh, for transcribing that particular verse in the manuscript you're working with. And there's also the quick look button. So here we, uh, uh, here we are. Uh, so you can highlight, put your cursor over the quick look button and that will bring up uh, the image uh, of the manuscript at that particular location. Now, if that location is saved, you have it exactly, otherwise uh, it interpolates the position uh, and hopefully that's what comes up in that little box. Otherwise you'll have to go to that particular manuscript and, and search for the, the text that you're interested in. Uh, but often this quick look button works if you've got enough of the, the locations tagged already. Well, these are some of the features of the software. I hope that gives you a, a taste, but now let's turn to the particulars of how to use it for, uh, or how Decodex is designed to work with lectionaries. Now, it's, um, okay, here we are. Here's the diagram of how the code is structured. Uh, it's designed around a number of classes of objects, and these objects are designed to correspond neatly uh, with the elements of lectionary manuscripts. The most basic uh, class is the lectionary verse. Uh, the Decodex framework is designed around the smallest textual unit in any manuscript. So when you're tagging the manuscript, you're, you're tagging it with verses. You're not tagging the pages, you're tagging the verses on the page. And when you transcribe it, you're transcribing verse by verse. or by 
or whatever is the smallest textual unit in your particular manuscript. And for biblical manuscripts, that's the Bible verse. And this is designed to be uh, unique for the, any particular manuscript. However, for lectionaries, things are a bit more complicated. Frequently, the same Bible verses can appear multiple times in a lectionary. For example, in Mark, uh, 15, uh, Mark 15, 43, 47, it's commonly read both on the third Sunday after Easter and also on, on Good Friday. And there's many other examples uh, like this in regular lectionaries. Uh, so we need a way for the system to know, what, uh, know that the underlying verses are the same, but to be able to distinguish the verses when they're at different lections. Uh, so to do this, Decodex Lectionary creates the lectionary verse class, uh, and these can point um, to a Bible verse in the, um, in the Decodex Bible, uh, from the Decodex Bible app. And in this way, multiple lectionary ver verses can refer to the same Bible verse, but still be unique in the manuscript. Lectionary verses are combined together in, in a lection object. Now, multiple lections can have the same lectionary verse if it's considered that they are uh, equivalent lections in different lectionary systems. So, for example, uh, the passage boundaries for the week after Pentecost show a significant variety in the lectionary tradition. Lectionaries commonly read Matthew 5, 20 to 41 from the Sermon on the Mount over this period. Manuscripts in what Burns calls group one divide these verses over the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, and others in group two divide it just over the Wednesday and the Thursday, and on the Friday, they have Matthew 7, 9 to 18. Uh, so in this case, the verses clearly correspond to each other, even though the periphery boundaries for the lectionaries, lections are different. And so in this case, the, so here are the, uh, he, uh, so in this case, the lectionary verse object should be shared with different lection objects used. So here are the, the lectionary verses. These are all stored in the database. And you can have different lection, um, lections which uh, choose the, the different lectionary verses for them and they can overlap. So on the group one lections for Wednesday can have this subset of verses and um, the ones in group two can have these. Uh, now, these verses are associated in the, um, uh, in the lection through the lectionary verse membership class, which stores the order of the verses. Now, the user can drag and drop to rearrange the order of verses in a lection using the admin interface. Uh, and this also stores the, uh, the expected number of characters in the verse to be able to assist in the uh, interpolation of verse locations. Uh, when you're tagging the locations and you want to search for a, a new verse, it needs to know how much text to expect in each verse. And, and that's what's handled. Uh, in the lectionary verse membership class. All right. There are seven different types of days that occur in lectionaries. In Decodex lectionary, they, uh, they all correspond to the abstract class that called liturgical day. And, it, um, the, and the first, uh, the first, concrete, or the first um, type of day that we find is the movable day. These are days that uh, come from the movable cycle in the liturgical year, which shifts according to the date of Easter. In the software, these dates are assigned uh, the season, um, that is Easter, Pentecost, Feast of the Cross, Epiphany, Lent, or Great Week, uh, the number of the week after the beginning of the season and the day of the week. The second cycle in the ecclesiastical year is the fixed cycle, beginning on September 1 and continuing to August 31. Uh, dates in this cycle are in, uh, instances of the fixed day, class. And these objects store the calendar date on which they fall in the year. The third class of liturgical day is for the 11 resurrection gospel passages for reading at mat matins for the Eothena day. Uh, these days are simply uh, given a number to correspond to which day they, they fall in the 11 passage cycle. And the final class of lectionary day is the uh, miscellaneous day. Uh, this is for a type of the, any type of day that doesn't fit into the other categories. Uh, for example, at the end of lectionaries, there are sundry pass often sundry passages for different occasions, such as the dedication of a church or for a petition for rain or for if there was an earthquake. Um, now, there are many types of lectionaries. Uh, lectionaries, let's, uh, I'll just explain some of the types of lectionaries. Lectionaries are grouped according to the days listed uh, in the section for the movable cycle of the liturgical year, co commonly known as the Synexarion. Uh, so there's the K type of lectionaries, which have um, uh, lessons on the Sundays, here marked in red. The SK lectionaries, which are for Saturday and Sunday, have Saturday and Sunday lessons. The ESK lectionaries, which have daily lessons 
uh, in the weekdays uh, between Easter and Pentecost, and then thereafter, Saturdays and Sundays. And then there are daily, um, the E-type of lectionary, which have daily lessons throughout the year, except for weekdays and Lent. Now, within these types, there's occasional variety. However, uh, the section of lectionaries which deals with the fixed cycle, called the Metalogion, uh, the, in, in the Metalogion, there's a great diversity, often in the days recorded, in the lectionary passages read, and in the saints remembered. Uh, so in addition, there are many lectionary manuscripts which don't conform to the standard structure, and these are given the category cell. Uh, these include lectionaries such as the Greek Arabic Lectionary Sinai Arabic 116, or, or L2211, which follows the old Jerusalemite liturgical calendar. Uh, and so you need, uh, need a structure in the software to be able to handle all these different type, types uh, of, of lectionaries. Uh, so this is done through the lectionary system class. Uh, this groups together any number of, of lection objects uh, and the lectionary uh, and lections are members of the, the lectionary system through what's called the lection membership class. The lection membership uh, can bring together a liturgical day of whatever type, be it in the fixed cycle or, or the movable cycle uh, or, or miscellaneous. It brings together a lection. It also has a rank to be able to, um, to give the uh, lections order in the manuscript. Uh, and you can rearrange the order by dragging and dropping um, the lections in the admin interface. And it also stores uh, the expected uh, amount of text uh, in the lectionary system uh, ahead of this lection, so to help with interpolating the location of passages. And finally, we come to the, the lectionary object, uh, which is a, a subclass of the core manuscript object from the codex. Now this, each lectionary requires a lectionary system to be able to know how to arrange the lections and verses uh, in the system. Multiple, multiple lectionary manuscripts can use the same lectionary system. Uh, and this class can, uh, handles the interface to be able to, uh, my, uh, to manage the navigating around the lectionary and for saving verse locations, uh, which I'll describe as I talk through the interface in a moment. So that's the structure of the code. Uh, I've used this uh, decodex lectionary to classify the Arab, the, into families, the uh, Arabic gospel lectionary tradition at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai and the Orthodox Patriarchal Library in Jerusalem. And I'll provide a walkthrough example of how you could, how that could be done using the software. So let's start with uh, Sinai Arabic 120. At first, we might not know what lectionary type it is. So we can, we'll just import the PDF and create a lectionary object a manuscript, lectionary manuscript object, and point it to uh, the e-lectionary system object, uh, which is um, the, has uh, lections for all the days in the movable cycle. Uh, so we'll just do that because that has the most number of lections and we'll, that's just as a starting place. So the first step is to tag locations of at least two verses so the system can uh, interpolate or extrapolate the positions of new locations in the manuscript. So the easiest place to start is with John 1.1 1, 1 on Easter Sunday. Uh, so you just click on, the, uh, click on the place in the manuscript where John 1.1 1, 1 starts, and then click the, the flag button. And then we can scroll to a, uh, just scroll down to find another place in the manuscript. It doesn't matter in particularly where. So let's find, let's say we found uh, the third Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, and then we can click and tag uh, that particular location. Now we have two locations saved. Uh, we can use um, the search bar at the top um, to be able to choose what, um, what lection we want in the manuscript. Uh, and then that will, uh, be, by uh, clicking on the lection, uh, that will jump to that where it expects that uh, lection to be in the manuscript. So let's uh, say so we click here and we click on the Pentecost Sunday. Uh, that might not find it immediately. Uh, so you might, need to, uh, you might need to look at the page before and afterwards. Uh, because at the moment only two locations are saved, uh, but hopefully we can uh, find it and click and save uh, the location for Pentecost. And now we know where Pentecost is, uh, we can look after Pentecost to find out does it have weekdays after it, after it or not. This particular lectionary doesn't, uh, so we can now classify this one as a, an ESK lectionary. So we can go into the admin interface, uh, swap it from an E lectionary to an ESK lectionary, uh, and then now we've got uh, now we've got a good idea of the structure. Uh, so now what we'll do is skip to the end of we'll, we'll search. Yeah, we'll, we'll click on the search uh, buttons 
search for um, Break Saturday at the end of the, uh, of the Synexarion. So once we've found that, we can tag the final verse in the Synexarion. And after that, we're in just interpolating between locations uh, in the manuscripts. Uh, and that, uh, which is more, ac more accurate than extrapolating. And so as you use the, uh, as you tag more and more locations, um, the searching becomes more and more accurate. Now, when I was categorizing uh, Arabic, the Arabic lectionaries, uh, I used to, I transcribed uh, a set passage, a set passages from uh, all the different uh, Arabic lectionaries. Uh, so with Decodex, you can uh, bring up a table with uh, the test passages on one side and all the, uh, the lectionaries you have in the system on the top, and it will compare the texts of the, the passages and highlight for you which, uh, which lectionaries, uh, which other manuscripts have a similar, uh, similar text, and that can help you categorize the manuscript into families, which is um, how I was able to do it for the, the Sinai and Jerusalem lectionaries. Uh, and, but also I was interested in comparing them with the continuous text manuscripts. And because each lect uh, lectionary verse points to the verse in the, the Bible verse, uh, that comparison is made easy in the software. Uh, so here I am comparing uh, the text of Sinai Arabic 120 uh, with other family, uh, families of continuous text, Arabic gospel manuscripts. Uh, so here a representative of what's known as family A and family B. Uh, and you can see that sometimes it aligns with family B here in the green, and other times it aligns uh, with the text of, uh, of sometimes family A, sometimes family B in the blue. And it's family B, that's the, uh, is the version that I was speaking about earlier, which has the highest proportion of non-Byzantine readings. And so this, uh, this lectionary manuscript uh, preserves in many places here in the weeks following Easter, uh, this important text of the Gospels. And also in Great Week, you can see here, uh, it, um, it agrees with the blue and also uh, with this other lectionary manuscript tradition, which also comes from family B at that stage. In the Menologion, uh, or in the 711 Resurrection Gospel uh, passages, uh, it also agrees with family B and other places in the Menologion. Uh, it, it agrees with uh, this important family. Now, there's many other lectionaries in the Sinai and Jerusalem um, uh, collections uh, that all, also all have this same uh, lectionary uh, text text type, uh, but they're uh, different at different stages. Different lections were added in the tradition, uh, so we have this at uh, this particular stage, which I called ESK two uh, C, uh, which I'm here representing by Sinai Arabic 138. Uh, at this stage, a number of different lections were added, including the weeks following Pentecost. Uh, so we have the uh, the system for the ESK. Uh, for Sinai Arabic 120, we can clone that lectionary system uh, and make one for Sinai Arabic 138. And here we can add in, so you can, here's the, a week for uh, the, the weekdays after Pentecost. You can click the plus button and that will add in a new lection at this point in the lectionary. And you can tag these locations and transcribe them. Uh, and it turns out that for these, uh, for ESK 2C, uh, these other manuscripts in the tradition also add these lections from the important family, uh, uh, Arabic family B. So here these, the Tuesday to Friday from the week after Pentecost uh, uses the text of family B and also the additional passages in the Menologion. So that's a brief rundown of how to use uh, Decodex lectionary. Uh, I think it's a powerful tool to make studying the lectionary tradition easy. It aids in transcription, tabulating a lectionary system, and navigating and, and comparing the text with other texts, uh, other lectionaries or continuous text manuscripts. The software will be released as open source sometime in 2020, uh, as with the rest of the Decodex framework. And, I hope, and hopefully software like this can assist in opening up the riches of the New Testament lectionary tradition for scholarship. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. And um, we've un unmuted to applaud this very clear presentation. I know that we have lots of lectionary um, people who've worked on lectionaries in the audience. So um, again, if you've got video on wave or um, put up your hand in the participant screen um, or type um, in the chat if you'd like to ask Rob a question.
I should use the mute all button. Joey, I see, has a question. So I shall mute everybody else and unmute Joey and unmute oh. Bob. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, it, it's great to see like more and more features coming out for Decodex. Um, you, you talked uh, right at the end there about, um, I guess like transcription. And I, I saw in some of the screenshots that you have like that little white box near the top where you can, I guess, presumably uh, type in your transcription of the text. That's right. Um, I, I also noticed um, that like it has a little TEI button. Um, yeah, that's the right. Is that, is that the main way that the uh, transcriptions will be encoded? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a good point. I, I didn't speak about um, how that works in the text. So there's, uh, in Decodex itself, um, there's uh, a markup uh, class and so that markup class, uh, you, you can create your own markup class. So whatever way you want to mark up a particular manuscript, so you can write it directly in TEI if you want to, or if you've got your own um, syntax for marking up a text, uh, you, you just create uh, a class to be able to handle that and be able to handle the, the interface for that transcription box. Uh, and then as long as it, and part of the, the requirement of that class is it needs to be able to convert the text to TEI. Um, so you can write it in whatever uh, markup you want uh, and you can have whatever HTML widget you want for that particular box. Uh, and then um, as there's a unified, uh, as long as you can call the method in that um, for that markup class and to convert it to TI, then that's acceptable for Decodex. So you can, um, yeah, so that's the way I've got it. So it's um, generic, oh, it's extensible. So you can, people can come up with their own way of marking up manuscripts. Fantastic, thank you. I've had a question on chat to ask uh, you, Lob, whether it's possible also to transcribe the lectionary the headings and whether you have oh, yes. the information, the rubrics available as part of your base text. Yes, that's right. That's that's a great question. I um, uh, yeah, I I skipped over that in my presentation. Uh, yes, you can. So the uh, the headings can be a, a still the same object, a lectionary verse, uh, but just these don't point to a Bible verse. So you'd have that at the top of the lection um, for the for the rubric, and and then you'd have the Bible verses after that. So that that's right. You can transcribe the uh, transcribe the rubric um, with the occasion and that kind of thing. Uh, and then, and, uh, you, and you've got the TEI or you've developed the, the structure to do that and encode it. Uh, so for, uh, I haven't, no, I haven't worked out how to trend, uh, how to get that into TEI yet. That's just mm -hmm. in the system. There's a, right. there's still things to still be developed over the next few months as I'm finishing um, my PhD. Uh, yeah. But at the moment it's just stored in the database as its own um, transcription. And then um, I'll work out a way to encode that in TEI. Uh, but yes, there is a way to do it, uh, and I should have mentioned that as I went through. No, thank you. Um, Bill, um, oh yes, I thought I ha you had a question which you wanted to ask about Greek. Uh, yes, um, uh, have you done any work yet, uh, Rob, on the Greek lectionary um, base or other versions, or is the program going to be such now you're waiting for others to do that on the input? Sure, great question. Uh, you, you should be able to use it directly with Greek as it is. I, have, I haven't used it for Greek lectionary myself, um, but I have used Decodex for Greek, uh, for Greek manuscripts. Um, so there's a way to import the, um, the TI files um, from, the, um, from the Birmingham site with the, the, the John and also from the um, virtual manuscript library. Um, you can just import the TI file into Decodex. Uh, and so all the, the, the verse, all it goes, goes straight into the database. So I've used that for, uh, for lots of Greek um, continuous text manuscripts. Uh, I haven't yet worked on um, a, a Greek lectionary manuscript, but I anticipate it would just be. Uh, uh, it wouldn't be a, any. There I wouldn't be any. Uh, there be in the lectionaries, thus the question. So, thanks. Yeah, no, I haven't haven't tried it yet. Okay. But it shouldn't be a problem. As as part of the Codex Akinthius project in Birmingham, we have now got one fully transcribed gospel lectionary. Oh, in XML, which, which is up in the university's eData site as well. So that TEI can be taken and um, used to do interesting things with lectionaries if they happen to match the same system. Yes, I, I need to look at that. 
Uh, thank you very much, Hugh. Well, well, I mean, Codex Akintios isn't sort of officially the least yet because um, yeah. the person who was supposed to be doing the first release at Cambridge University Library has um, has has got has gone on leave um, during the lockdown. So when we're unlocked, you might be able to look at see more of Codex Akintios than there has been thus far. Well, that's great. Any other questions? Um, either I, I have a question. Oh yes, Dennis. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just started working on uh, uh, textual tradition of Romans in the lectionaries. Uh, so in the, in the few months ahead, I'm going to start actually dealing with, with data. So this is uh, very exciting. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, I believe that the main contribution of this tool uh, is because it builds well the, the structure of the lectionary, correct? or the lectionaries. Um, now I'm just wondering um, how user-friendly it is for someone who who wishes to transcribe the, not test passages, but the whole, all the lections, every single verse. Because as far as I understood, you go line by line, tagging and transcribing. Is that correct? Uh, uh, that's right. I've, um, uh, yeah, you, you just, as you transcribe, you, you, as you're transcribing, uh, when you get to the end of one verse, you just click to where your eye, where your eyes still are, but at the end of the verse, you just click to where the new verse will be, and you then you press spacebar to tag the verse, and then you just keep going. Um, so it's quite quick to to transcribe. Uh, I've transcribed, um, I think, uh, two full Arabic uh, gospel lectionaries, uh, okay. and then a whole lot of um, uh, a whole lot of other ones. So it's it's I designed the software to make it quick for me to be able to transcribe. Um, these lectionaries, um, yeah. So you don't have to transcribe it uh, the, entirely. You can just pick and choose which verses you want, or you can just start, go from the start and work to the end. Um, whatever workflow works for you. But you have to tag every single line. We don't have to tag every line. You just tag the ones that you're interested in. Uh, so you just tag whatever uh, whatever you want to tag. If it's if uh, I would tag any usually um. If I find a verse, I don't want to have to find it again, so I just click and press save. And so once it's uh, once that's done, you can um, it's it's saved there forever. You can always go back and find it easily. Uh, but you don't have to tag every uh, every verse if you don't want to. Okay, thank you. No worries. Great. Dora's question, which she's just put in in chat, was about transcribing or indexing. Presumably, you can. You've already got some lectionary indexes that you've created within the system in order to be able to identify, broadly speaking, where you are within a lectionary manuscript. But presumably, you can actually increase your understanding of the different lectionary systems at, were you to go through and index multiple lectionaries. Yeah, that's right. So you could use it just for. Um just for indexing uh, lectionaries to, to look at the look at their structure uh, or you could also use it for transcribing so that's um, that's however uh, whatever you're doing in your research well I think this is going to be a very useful tool indeed so so thank you very much for taking the time to present it and um, I think uh, unless there's any, well other quest other people with questions can um, contact you directly but once again um, Everyone is unmuted to express their warm appreciation, both to Rob and to Jeff. Thank you very much for getting up extra early to present to us today.